Hello and welcome to Sonola Glenn series. This is our April show and we have quite a show packed in for you today. I am Diana Rohini Levine. I'm a California naturalist and also a mother of two students at Sonola Glenn Elementary School. So I have the pleasure to introduce an outstanding person who is Bart Shepard, the senior director of the Stein Hart Aquarium at the California Academy of Science. And he has been with the uh, Academy of Science for now 24 years. He has wanted to be a scientist from the very early years. And he's a scientist, he's a researcher, he's an advocate, and he's also a scuba diver with over 250 dives. So let me, without further ado, bring on our subject matter expert to talk about fish today, Bart Shepard. Hi, thank you. Hi. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. And I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to the kids about fish. Uh, we're just so excited to have you. No, it's great. I'm happy to do it. I love fish, so I'm happy to talk. <laughs> so tell us, um, we, we know one thing about you, you love fish, uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to this position. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, I, you know, I, I started early, I think, you know, six or seven years old, I got my first aquarium and I really give my mom a lot of the credit. Uh, you know, she um, would go to the fish store with me and help me pick out fish. We would clean the tank, you know, at the together. And so um, she really nurtured that in the beginning. And uh, I've kept aquariums pretty much my whole life. There was a little bit of time in my teenage years where I didn't do it, uh, but pretty much the rest of my life I've kept aquariums. And it just sort of drove me into this direction of, of wanting to work, um, you know, with animals, aquatic animals, in particular coral reef animals, which is really where my uh, primary focus is, but through the lens of an aquarium, you know, not a university research person, but, but really through an aquarium. That's amazing. So maybe we can talk a little bit about your aquarium and um, and I'm calling it your aquarium. I guess it's the whole community's aquarium um, and talk a little bit about how many species are in the aquarium and how big it is uh, for just to give an idea of how large it really is. Yeah, of course. Well, well Steinert Aquarium, you know, it, it's an important uh, aquarium historically in the United States. We're actually the oldest continually operated municipal aquarium in the United States. And mm -hmm. uh, we were founded, we opened in 1923 in San Francisco, but we were really founded in 1917 when the voters of San Francisco voted on what's called a charter amendment to approve the construction of an aquarium um, at the California Academy of Sciences. And the money was originally given um, by these, this, these two Steinhardt brothers. It was one brother, Ignatz, who gave it uh, in memory of his other brother, Sigmund, and they had they were Bavarian merchants who had made a bunch of money in the post gold rush days in San Francisco. And um, and so, you know, for two hundred thousand dollars and change but back at that time, uh, they had an aquarium named after them forever, which is, you know, quite the deal. Um, so we're, we're an old historical aquarium um, and we, you know, we've been a part of San Francisco uh, culture now for a very long time. Uh, we rebuilt the aquarium and, and reopened as part of the new California Academy of Sciences in 2008. And we're a pretty, uh, you know, moderate sized aquarium. We have about maybe 600,000 gallons of total volume um, and, uh, you know, we, but we're known for our, the diversity of our collection, the many different kinds of plants and animals that we have in our collection. So we have a rainforest, we have African penguins, we have a white alligator named Claude. Uh, we have the world's largest and deepest indoor coral reef. Um, so we have a very strong collection across uh, many different groups of, of animals and plants as well. Wow, that is quite amazing. I. Um, I have been there and I have seen the aquarium and it's uh, quite impressive and I'm encouraging everyone to go and uh, check it out. Um, how large is the tank itself? Our biggest tank is the Philippine Coral Reef. It's about 220,000 gallons uh, and it's 25 feet deep in the front in the main window and you know, that's the the aquarium you see in the picture there and that's something that's been it was a huge part of my career. I started working on that um, exhibit in 2002, six years before we reopened. And 
uh, you know, so it's been something that, that is, has been a big part of my life now for quite some time. So with coral reef being uh, such an important part to you, I, that probably drives you out scuba diving quite a bit. Yeah, not in the last year, unfortunately, but, yeah. uh, but it does. We have a, an initiative. I'm um, a co-director of what we call Hope for Reefs, which is a uh, research and conservation initiative around coral reefs. And, uh, and I've helped lead that initiative now for about five years, maybe a little more than five years. And um, that, that does allow me in, in normal times to get out in the world and go scuba diving. And, and I really do that in two different avenues. One is um, working on coral reef restoration. Like how can we uh, start to regenerate coral reefs and bring back the health of coral reefs that have been damaged by disease and climate change and poor fishing practices and things like that. And the other is exploring the least known coral reefs on the planet. And so um, we do very deep scuba diving using what's called a mixed gas rebreather. It's a very fancy scuba diving equipment that lets us dive down to about 500 feet deep. So, wow. uh, so I do some um, really interesting research on these deep reefs that have been really understudied. Uh, and um, we try and find and describe new species of fish that are that are found there that no one's ever seen before. Or no one hasn't been given a name. And uh, we get to do that work, which is also something that's really exciting for me. Wow, that is naming a species is is just such an exciting thing. I'm a scuba diver, so I understand it's a whole nother world under there. And and uh, my daughter is just ten, but has already been scuba diving three times, and so I can't wait till she's up and scuba diving more often, so I can uh, go with her and enjoy that environment. So I wanted um, before we asked a couple of a, a bunch of questions uh, from students uh, that sent to you, um, I wanted to ask ask you what it's like working with um, a famous person. So Dinosaur Train <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. is a PBS uh, series and, and the paleontologist on it is Dr. Scott Sampson and he is the executive director newly uh, appointed there at uh, the California Academy of Sciences. So it, has that been uh, a, a great, great asset to the Academy? It has been, yes. Um, Dr. Scott has been great. And, you know, we spent the past year or so, um, I've been on a team of people that have been working with him closely, looking at the mission of the Academy and what is our purpose in the world and, and how do we, um, you know, strive to make the planet a better place. And it's been, you know, quite a rewarding experience. Um, I'll admit my kids are a little older. They're um, teenage girls. And so they, they, we didn't have the dinosaur train thing in my, in my house. So I didn't, um, I didn't know that going into it. It was something that we learned uh, that I learned sort of after the fact. I uh, first met him at a California in Nature um, uh, network conference, a leadership conference, and I saw him and I did one of these fangirl things where I had to take a selfie with him and I don't do that to anyone. <laughs> so um, so I had kids right in the right age and it made mommy very popular that week. So um, so I was really excited. So I'm, I'm also glad that we have him back in the California area and uh, he's such an asset. Uh, uh, to the community at large. So let's um, let's uh, throw some really hard questions at you <laughs> uh, from some of the students um, and uh, you can answer however you'd like. Uh, so the first one is, what is a fish's life expectancy usually? I know that's uh, a broad question, but. <laughs> it is, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because it, it, it's all over the map. It really depends on the fish. And I'll give you a couple of extreme examples. So um, in, in some places in Africa, there are these little fish, they're called killifish, and they're really almost like annual fish, right? So they live in ponds that dry up over certain times of the year. So when the rain comes, uh, the water activates eggs that have been lodged in the soil, and those eggs hatch, and they grow into little fish, and those fish grow up, and they become adults and they start to mate and they lay their eggs before the rainy season stops and that rain and that water all dries up again. So they're, they're on an annual cycle um, where they go from egg to death um, in one year. And then the opposite end, some fish have very, very long lifespans. So at the Steinhardt Aquarium, we have an Australian longfish named Methuselah um, that we have had since 1938. And um, we brought that animal in 
uh, back then from Australia. And we don't know exactly how old it was when it arrived, but that's, you know, closing in on 100 years. So you can see that it varies quite a bit depending on the fish. Wow, that is um, extraordinary, both ends of that. Do fish play together? You know, play is really something that's difficult to identify. We know it um, when we see it, you know, amongst children, or we see it sometimes with puppies or kitty, kittens or things like that. Uh, but, but for animals like fish, we may often think something is playing when it can really be a totally different kind of behavior, whether it's, uh, you know, a fish defending its territory or being aggressive towards another fish or trying to impress a mate, a potential mate or feeding. Um, so we do see a lot of different behaviors and playing is sometimes something that we'll call them. There's a there's one uh, group of fish they're called cichlids and it's a family of fish that's very very successful and you know I like to think of them as very smart they're they're smart fish and um, they have been documented to play in aquariums uh, with things like not natural things like thermometers right like they'll pick the thermometer in their mouth and they'll move it to a different part of the tank and it'll kind of float back and then they'll pick it in their mouth and they'll move it. Um, so we have seen some of that kind of behavior. And sometimes we see different fish interacting with each other, different kinds of fish interacting with each other in the wild. And it may look like playing to us, uh, but it could be different other behaviors. So for example, there are some fish that feed down in the sand and they go and they may stick their whole head in the sand and kind of dig around and looking for worms or little bugs or things that are in the sand to eat and other fish that hang around right along with them and they they may get the stuff that tries to swim away and so there's a feeding behavior there that's going on that might look like playing to us well, i can understand that i i could spend hours just watching uh fish and their behavior patterns it's it's so rewarding so i could see how that would would be um difficult to determine whether it's play or not. Do you have any, do any fish have live births or do they only lay eggs? Yeah, again, we see both of those. Um, so uh, there are many groups of fish that are live bearers that give birth to fully formed young that swim away. Um, you know, I can think of from the home aquarium world, uh, guppies and mollies and platies are very common fish that people have in their home aquariums that are live bearers that give live birth. Here in California, in the coast of California, we have fish called surf perch that do the same thing. They have fully formed little baby fish inside them. Then they actually give birth and they, and they swim out. Um, seahorses is another one. Uh, where, you know, people, the male actually gives birth to the babies. Uh, and then you see the opposite. There, there are fish that, that only lay eggs. There, I mentioned the killifish before that lay eggs in the soil when the pond is drying up. Um, there are some really interesting fish in Africa that I used to keep in my home aquarium when I was in high school and in early college that are known as um, cichlids, again, from Lake Malawi in Africa. And they're actually mouth brooders. So the female will pick up the eggs and carry them around in her mouth the whole time while they develop. And, and then when the little babies hatch out, of the egg she'll open her mouth and let them swim out and they'll eat and feed um, from algae and things and if there's danger she opens her mouth and signals them and they all swim back in and she protects them in her mouth uh, and so we'll see that and then there are fish where the male actually does that behavior uh, like the asian arowana and it's actually the male that carries the eggs in his mouth uh, until the eggs hatch wow that is so fascinating i spent some time um I lived in Africa for a year in Goma Zaire, and, uh, and uh, it, I didn't see a, a lot of fish there, but on the coastal areas, uh, when I went out swimming or scuba diving, I saw a fish I had never mm -hmm. seen in muddles and puddles and, um, and swamps and, and the ocean front, and it was quite extraordinary. Um, what is the world's largest fish? Yeah, the world's largest fish is the whale shark. Right. And, and it's a plankton feeder, so it's not something to be afraid of. It feeds on some of the tiniest organisms in the sea. So then maybe back to back, what's the world's smallest fish? Well, I think right now there are some, some little minnows from Southeast Asia that are documented to be the world's smallest fish. But, but I would bet that there are a great many tiny little fish that have yet to be discovered, right? Um, when you think of scientists working on um, fish, you know, you, you think of things that people 
commonly would study sharks or maybe, you know, piranha or, you know, there, there's a lot of charismatic fish that people would um, focus on. I and mean, there's probably very few people in the world that said, you know, I want to study these tiny little gray fish that <laughs> you know, are really hard to find. So I would imagine there are a, a ton of undescribed tiny fish all over the world that we don't know about yet, just simply because people haven't uh, had the interest in trying to study them. When you dive down 500 feet, which is just um, crazy in my mind to yeah. even think about, um, do you see more large fish or small fish? It de depends on where we are. Um, okay. You know, a lot of times there's um, a lot of times we will see sharks. Uh, you know, it depends on how much fishing is takes place in that area, to be honest. Uh, okay. and, but we're with the group of fish that we study. Uh, mostly re little reef fish. So we're mostly looking at kind of medium sized fish, you know, a few inches long is what we're typically interested in. Great. Um, are your, are fish vegetarian, carnivore or omnivores? Yep, all of the above. Uh, all, <laughs> check, <yeah>. check, check, check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like people. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Is there, um, do they slant one way or another depending on if they're salt water versus fresh water? No, I don't think so. But I would say, you know, that like, for instance, in the deep reefs that we study, you don't really see um, many vegetarian or herbivorous fish, we would call them, um, because simply there's not enough light down there for the algae to grow. So the community shifts to one where there are more um, what we would say are planktivores or fish that are feeding on little tiny animals that float around in the water column. Um, so you see changes in the community, certainly based on on the habitat. Um, do you eat fish? Less and less. Okay. <laughs> I do, so, I do um, you know, a lot of times when we're out in the field um, diving and, and working on research trips, I mean, if you're on an island somewhere like that, I mean, that's what people are eating, right? So right. I, I do eat fish. I have a lot of rules and the rules are getting stricter and stricter. And, um, you know, and, and the question of are all fish OK for humans to eat? Certainly not. Um, and there's right. lots of reasons why some fish are not OK to eat. Uh, some are poisonous. Right. And, you know, there are um, actual fish that are poisonous enough to kill you if you were to eat them. Um, some fish are endangered and you wouldn't mm -hmm. want to take them from the wild you know, to eat them. Um, some fish get poisonous depending on what they eat. So there's a, a, a syndrome that's called cigatera that is found, is found in fish that live around coral reefs. And it's because there's um, a tiny little part of the plankton that's in the water there that the small fish eat and then the bigger fish eat that and then the bigger fish eat that and then the fish that we would eat are eating those fish. And it's what we call biomagnification. That poison that started with in the plankton gets magnified as you move up through the food chain and you go to more and more predators because they're eating more and more and more of that step below them in the food chain. And so um, Cigatera can give like a neurological problems like it makes you, um, you know, you can't control your muscles and you have all kinds of issues. Um, based on a tiny plankton that was eaten by the food of the food of the food of the fish that you're eating. So it gets more and more complicated and, um, you know, it's, there's, it's good to know uh, which fish are safe to eat and which fish are responsible to eat. And there are, you know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program is a great example of a way that you can learn um, more about the fish that you eat. They actually provide these little handouts, which are great. I have one in my wallet, which you um, can unfold and, and tell which ones are endangered, which ones are right. safe for you to eat, which ones are safe for you to eat according to the environment and, yeah. and not ruining the ecosystem. So I and think they have, that, um, they have apps too for your phone that are based on your region where you live. So if you're on the East Coast, um, you know, they'll focus on the East Coast fish. Or if you're out here, you focus on the West Coast. That is um, super helpful. Apps are really <laughs> helpful. Yeah. So this is a, a very serious question. Do fish go to school? I know. It's, it is funny. I, I mean, I love the, I love the question. Um, <laughs> I don't think that there's technically any schools out in the ocean or in the lakes and rivers um, that the fish go to. But, you know, the, the way that I would answer it is that... Um, fish certainly uh, are, have the capability to learn things. And so one of the ways that we work with 
uh, many of the animals, most of the animals at our aquarium is through what we call be behavioral training. Uh, and so for instance, if you think of, we have a, a 100,000 gallon Amazon flooded forest uh, habitat that says some huge big freshwater fish in it and a bunch of different kinds of fish. And they all need to eat different things. And some of them are kind of bullies and they'll steal the food from the other fish. And so we had to learn, we have to learn how to manage them. And the way that we do that is we, we do what we call station training. And we have these visual targets and it kind of looks like a bullseye on a stick and you'll put it in the water and the fish that you want can be trained to come over and feed at that station. And so we can put a bunch of people with these different targets in different parts of the uh, habitat and they can pull fish, They'll, the fish are trained to come feed at their station. So we know they get the right amount of diet, they get any medicine that they might need. They're not you know, competing with the other fish and getting the wrong kind of food because they like that one better that the other fish gets. Um, so we use that as a way to, to manage uh, the, the fish within the aquarium. That is uh, uh, good to know. This might lead into this next question, which is, how do you keep um, sharks or, or fish from eating other fish in the tanks? <laughs> yeah, you can't always do that. <laughs> I, mean, I would love to say we're 100% successful at that, but we can't. Um, and, and so, you know, sharks are sharks. And ultimately, at some point, some instinct is going to kick in. And if they're hungry and they see a fish that they think they can catch and get, that's what they're going to do. Um, so, you know, we, we, we try and do many things for that. There's the behavioral training that I mentioned. Uh, we try and keep all of the animals um, well-fed and happy. And then we spend a lot of time, probably the most important thing that we do is looking at what's in that tank and, and making sure um, what, what we're, that we're managing the, the collection or the community of fish that's in that tank so that they're as compatible as they can be. All right. We're not, we're not putting things in there that we know are going to fight. We're not putting things in there um, that we know are going to eat each other, you know, on day one. Right. Um, do you scuba dive in, in your aquarium? Do you actually? You no, know, it's, it's been a long time since I've done that. Um, it's actually been really tempting this past year since I haven't been able to travel and do um, field research out around the world. Um, but it, it has been a long time since I've been in one of the tanks. It's really fun though because uh, there's so many fish in there, and they're really accustomed to the divers. Uh, and so it's probably the most fish intensive diving that you could ever do uh, is in an aquarium. Is it something that other people like uh, friends named Diana Rohini Levine get to do? When they, is, well, I, I'll it, say we, we do. We have a community of volunteer divers. It's about 40 people right now um, that come in and they help us. They do um, dives. We have them in every day. Uh, in, in the normal world, we would be doing public programs where the diver is actually interacting with the public and talking about uh, coral reef conservation or coral reefs. Um, but you know now it's a little different. Uh, but they they come in and they help us. They clean the windows. They feed certain things. They do public programs. Um, so you know the opportunity certainly exists. Sign me up. <laughs> um, next question: Can fish taste what they eat? You know I don't know that people know that. Um, but I will say that, that many fish have they have very specific diets and that many fish are very, very picky eaters, right? Like some kids probably. Um, and there, you know, there are certain butterfly fish that live uh, on coral reefs that only eat certain kinds of coral or they only eat little worms. Um, there are things that are very, uh, you know, picky about, about their food. And I don't know that it's based on taste. Um, and, and again, I, I don't know if anybody's ever studied the taste buds in a fish's tongue. Um, that would be kind of an obscure uh, PhD study course to take. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's not to say somebody hasn't done that. I have my daughter's uh, PhD uh, thesis all worked out right there. <laughs> taste in fish. Um, I, you know, we often hear about sharks uh, bite and then let go of of yeah. their victim because they don't taste good. And I think that's just a, something that's just thrown out there so frequently. Yeah, I and mean, there's probably a lot of things that are factored in, right? And I'm, certainly the, the feel of it, um, you know, the, the texture and the resistance that um, the thing that was bit, I'm sure, plays in as well. 
Sure. Um, this is a kind of a three part, uh, but uh, do fishes sleep? And uh, if so, how long and how do they take rest? Do they just float? <laughs> Again, I mean, fish are so remarkable and wonderfully diverse that you see lots of different strategies. So I'll give you a few examples. We've been talking about sharks and there are some sharks that are what we call ram ventilators. That is, in order for them to breathe, they have to continuously swim. They have to force water across their mouth, and across their gills in order to get the oxygen so that they can breathe. Uh, and so those fish, they never really sleep like you or I sleep. They're constantly swimming. They may kind of turn things down and get a little quieter, but they never stop and rest on the bottom. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, and sort of the opposite, you have fish like the parrotfish. Um, and probably many people know about parrotfish. They're beautifully colored. Uh, they live on coral reefs. They actually eat coral. Uh, many of them eat the coral. Um, they sleep uh, sound asleep, um, you know, more than you or me probably, uh, in a mucus cocoon, almost like a little sleeping bag that they make for themselves, that they, ex they ex excrete this mucus out of the skin and make this little like balloon um, that they are wedged into like a little crevice in the rock or in the coral and they go completely sound asleep uh, and are know, the whole night. Um, so again, you know, fish are very, very diverse. And so you see a wide range of, of these kinds of behaviors. So there's going to be a wide range for this next, which is how much food <laughs> yeah. does a fish eat in a day? <laughs> yep. What's the how range? How much food does a fish eat in a day? Again, it, it really depends. And, um, you know, there are some fish, some of the fish that we work with on coral reefs, I mentioned planktivores, that they feed on tiny little floating animals that are part of the plankton. You know, they, that's a, a tiny little thing. They're feeding continuously. Um, the entire day, they may be hovering just above the reef, eating little crustaceans, little things that are drifting by in the current, and they're just feeding, 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 feeding the entire day. There are other fish that are um, large sort of predatory type fish. I think of um, like the alligator gar, which is an amazing fish that's found in the southeastern United States and down into Central America. We have some at Steinhardt Aquarium that we've had since the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, they get really big and they're armored and they're almost like a dinosaur fish. They look really prehistoric and, um, you know, they may only eat once a week or so. And again, it's sort of opportunistic. They, they, they found themselves in the right situation. There was a prey item that was swimming by that they could get, they get it, and they, they might eat a bigger meal that then lasts them for a longer time. Hmm. Um, here's a personal question. What's your favorite sea creature? Oh, my favorite sea creature. I think I would have to go with coral. I've always been interested in coral reefs. And, and to me, the, the tiny little coral animal is fascinating because it, it builds these cities underwater. It builds these structures that can be seen from outer space um, that are homes for so many other different types of creatures. And um, it's also an animal now that's under a lot of threat uh, and mm -hmm. needs our help. And so that's something that I've spent the better part of the last decade of my life trying to figure out how it is that now I can turn around and help the coral reefs and make sure that they have a future on this planet. So you had mentioned a parrotfish and parrotfish eats uh, the coral. Is that mm -hmm. uh, a, a good thing or a bad thing? I When I'm diving, I can hear them crunching. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, it's very loud. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, and it's all, you know, it's all, fine when it's in balance. Actually, what we see more of is um, parrotfish are being collected for food. People like to eat them. Uh, and so when you have places where a lot of the parrotfish have been fished for food, um, the coral reef often gets overgrown by algae because the parrotfish are really scraping the rocks and getting the algae. And so they help keep the reef clean. They're an important part of keeping coral reefs sort of clean and healthy. That's um, the balance is very important. And this might lead into kind of my uh, final question, which is how do we as students, as educators, as community members help our oceans and help our uh, lakes um, be safe for fish? How do we, what do we do? You mentioned the, the uh, uh, Monterey Aquarium and how we can eat uh, more responsibly. Are, what other things would you suggest that we should be doing? 
Yeah, I think there's there's three big threats to um, rivers, lakes, streams, the ocean, uh, and um, those are um, pollution, um, mm -hmm. overfishing, and climate change, uh, and probably climate change being the most important one. So, so I think things that that people can do is really supporting a move to. Uh, a, an economy that's not as based on carbon, right? Where we're not burning fossil fuels for our cars and our houses and our factories and all of that. Um, more electric power, more solar power, more renewable power. I think making sure that, um, you know, if you do eat fish or seafood in any way, that um, that it's, it's responsibly managed, that you're getting, uh, you know, things that aren't damaging the environment. And I think pollution is one I would I would include plastic in that uh, mm -hmm. and just making sure that chemicals and plastics and things like that don't find their way into our rivers, lakes, streams and the ocean. And um, on the plastic, um, microplastic is, you know, the really, really small parts are the ones that I find that people don't really know about. Those are perhaps a bigger threat to to uh, ocean safety for fish or? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly concerned about that. Um, you know, and I think microplastics have been found in things that people eat, right? Like oysters and sea salt. And, you know, so we know we're, get, we're getting it. So we're putting it in the environment and it's coming to us. And we know right. that's happening. Um, you know, to be honest, when when all of the time that I've spent out scuba diving and I mean, granted, I'm not seeing the microplastics, but the thing that stands out the most to me in terms of plastic pollution is fishing gear. Uh, and hmm. so we see nets, we see fishing lines, um, we see all kinds of fishing equipment all caught on the reef. Um, and so there's a connection there between fishing and plastics, as well as thinking about plastics as pollution. I want to um, thank you so much for joining us, and I want to invite folks to um, to look online at the Steinhardt Aquarium, uh, calacademy.org is the website, and you see it right there. And are, are you're accepting guests at at this time um, to come yeah. to the? Okay, we are. We reopened uh, mid March, mid this month, and you know we're operating on a. A lower capacity, about 20% of what our building capacity would be. And, you know, doing all of the things that we need to do, masks required, extra cleaning, all of that kind of stuff. That's great that you've really um, been able to open and open safely. So that's um, really, I think, uh, kids need to go out and explore and be out there and, and seeing nature and, and the connection between children and nature is such a has such an impact on mental health and uh and and really just uh we really need you uh, so much uh, at well, this moment. we need all of you as well i mean the, the uh it's wonderful to see the building alive again with our guests that's great and thank you so much again um again this is bart shepherd he's the senior director of the steinhardt aquarium at the california academy of science thank you so much for taking the time and uh we wish you well and uh and, and we will be visiting the aquarium aquarium at sometime in the near future wonderful thank you it was my pleasure thank you